Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final in this series of seminars by me, Andrew Marsden, on the subject of the protection of shareholders from unfairly prejudicial conduct. Uh, again, I've muted the sound for all participants and I've turned everyone's cameras off in order to preserve the bandwidth. Um, once again, I have also prepared some slides to accompany this presentation and I shall attempt to share those with you now. In the first of these seminars, uh, I introduced you to the jurisdiction and we examined some of the points of practice and procedure relating to applications under section 994. In the second of these seminars, I looked at uh, the elements that a petitioner needs to establish in order to invoke the jurisdiction and in particular the requirements of unfairness and prejudice. And then last week I ran through um, some examples of the most common types of unfairly prejudicial conduct that one comes across in practice. This week I am going to uh, examine the remedies for unfairly prejudicial conduct. Um, if time permits at the end of this uh, uh, e examination of remedies I'll also say a few words about uh, uh, the discrete subjects of offers to purchase and applications to strike out petitions under section 994 and I'll also uh, uh, have a few words to say about mediation in the context of uh, these disputes. So beginning then with an examination of the remedies for unfairly prejudicial co conduct um, of a company's affairs. And I need to take you back to section 996, subsection one of that section um, uh, of the Companies Act, of course, um, which is entitled Powers of the Court under this part. And it reads, as you can see, uh, if the court is satisfied that a petition is well founded, um, it may make such order as it thinks fit for giving relief in respect of the matters complained of. Let me first focus on the opening words there, if the court is satisfied that a petition is well founded. Uh, those uh, opening words uh, uh, mean that if the petitioner establishes that he has been the victim of unfairly prejudicial conduct, um, uh, then uh, 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 the jurisdiction to grant relief is opened up. I've got to emphasize once again the importance of a careful and comprehensive drafting of the petition because it is only establishment of uh, uh, the matters complained of in the petition as involving unfairly prejudicial conduct that will give rise to uh, the jurisdiction to grant relief. The petitioner will only be entitled to any relief at all if he can establish unfairly prejudicial conduct of one of the matters uh, in, in one respect as it is pleaded within the petition. If he fails to establish unfairly prejudicial conduct then the simple fact of the matter is that the court has no jurisdiction to order any relief whatsoever. If the jurisdiction is engaged through the present uh, the petitioner's demonstration of unfairly prejudicial conduct, then uh, 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 the court has a very wide discretion indeed to make such order as it thinks fit. On the face of it, subsection one uh, affords uh, uh, the court perhaps not an entirely untrammeled uh, discretion or unfettered discretion. For on its face, section 996 provides that the form of relief that the court um, is to order must give relief in respect of the matters complained of. But in uh, a leading case in this area, a case called Grace and Biagioli, the Court of Appeal made it clear that the court has uh, to look at all the relevant circumstances in deciding uh, what kind of order 
it is fair to make and that it's not limited to making an order that just seeks to reverse or put right the immediate uh, conduct complained of. Uh, for my part, I still think that it's arguable on the face of uh, the wording of subsection one itself that such a restriction does apply, namely that it is arguable that in fact um, uh, the relief must uh, 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 be uh, such as to give relief in respect of the matters referred to and established in the petition. Um, of course, uh, given the uh, standing of the Court of Appeals decision in the uh, Biagioli case, um, uh, 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 any court challenging that um, uh, uh, or any decision challenging it would have to be a decision of the Supreme Court or at least another decision of the Court of Appeal. Subsection 2 of section 996 then goes on in its opening words to say without prejudice to the generality of subsection 1, that is without prejudice to the general discretion to make such order as it thinks fit for giving relief in respect of the unfair prejudice, the court's order may, and it then sets out a series of examples of the type of relief that the court might consider appropriate in any particular case. Just running through those, um, uh, the court may consider it appropriate to make an order that regulates the conduct of the company's affairs in the future. So for example, it might uh, require board or shareholder meetings to be called on a prescribed basis or with a prescribed regularity, and it may regulate the participation in such meetings. Secondly, the relief may take the form uh, of an order by the court requiring the company to do or refrain from doing um, uh, an act complained of. Uh, these are, of course, the prohibitive or mandatory injunctive reliefs. Um, so by way of an example, uh, the court might think it appropriate in a given case to uh, make an order preventing a uh, rights issue in respect of shares in circumstances where the pe persons conducting the affairs of the company and proposing to exercise uh, 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 the power to uh, and make a rights issue, we're proposing to do so for an ulterior purpose, um, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, for the consolidation of power in their hands or their associates' hands, rather than the raising of funds for uh, the company itself. The third illustrative example of the sorts of relief that the courts uh, may, may make, uh, as they're referred to in subsection two, um, is a, a, a potential for the court to authorise proceedings to be brought in the name of and on behalf of the company. This, that is authorising effectively de derivative proceedings to be brought um, in the name of the company, say against a, a, a director uh, guilty of breaches of the duties owed to the company, such as, for example, a, a diversion of a business opportunity away from the company for his own benefit. The fourth example uh, is uh, an example uh, uh, of a form of relief uh, that might involve requiring the company not to make uh, uh, alterations in its articles. So the court may make an order prohibiting a change in articles such as an order prohibiting the conferring of further powers on uh, the majority directors and shareholders or removing or restricting a requirement for uh, minority shareholding, uh, uh, minor, minority shareholder approval of some proposed action. And then the final illustrative example given in subsection two, and by far the most important practice in, in practice, certainly the most common form of relief that's come across in practice, is uh, 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 the potential for the court to make an order providing for the purchase of the petitioner's shares either by the uh, uh, members uh, against whom unfairly prejudicial conduct is uh, established or by the company itself. My experience in practice is that purchase orders uh, 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 as contemplated by uh, uh, that part of subsection two are very often made even though the unfairly prejudicial conduct that is established might possibly have been remedied by a much less drastic form of relief than a, than a purchase order, such as, for example, an order regulating the future conduct of the company in a manner that doesn't 
involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. I'll come back to explain uh, why I think that is in practice in just one second. In a minute, I'm going to concentrate on uh, the aspects of the purchase order remedy. But before I do so, I just want to make some general observations as regards uh, 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 the remedies um, and the principles governing uh, the choice uh, and form of remedy to be granted in any particular case. The first thing to emphasize again is that the remedies in subsection two of section 996, forgive the typographical error, um, is uh, 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 merely uh, an illustrative uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, non-comprehensive list of the reliefs available. Um, the court can make any type of order that it considers appropriate. So, for example, the courts have made uh, orders for damages in respect to financial losses suffered by the company or by the petitioner himself. Um, uh, and the courts have made orders for rectification of the company's statutory books. So, for example, rectifying uh, 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 an unfairly prejudicial uh, share transfer or issue of shares that has been recorded in the uh, company's uh, register of members. The courts will only make an order providing relief if they consider it's appropriate to do so. There is no automatic entitlement to a form of relief once unfairly prejudicial conduct has been established. If very little prejudice is suffered, the courts might uh, be persuaded not to uh, order any relief at all. The courts will also try to grant relief in a form that it considers proportionate. Um, it may not, for example, order a buyout if the unpre unfairly prejudicial conduct is modest in nature. It's also clear that the courts will seek to assess the appropriateness of uh, a form of relief as at the date that the court makes its order. It will do so in light of the circumstances and practicalities of the situation as they then exist. I said I'd come back to it and I think it's this principle that I think underlines the approach that the court generally tends to favour the making of a purchase order in the face of a finding of unfair prejudice. The court recognises that if the case has continued all the way to a trial and it's had to make a determination rather than the matter resolving itself by settlement of some sort, then the relationship between the parties is likely to have broken down to such an extent that it's no longer practicable to expect the participants to continue in business together. That realisation, in my view, generally leads to the making of a purchase order, even though the particular instance of unfairly prejudicial conduct might have been remedied by a uh, less drastic remedy in any given case. It may sound obvious, but uh, it's worth stating that the court will not grant relief if it were to do so was to uh, serve no useful purpose. So the court will not try to grant uh, a relief in a, or will not accede to a grant of relief in a form that um, uh, uh, seeks to regulate, say, the conduct of future meetings if it's clear that the participants, um, uh, uh, including the prot protagonists, um, uh, 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 shareholders and creditors, perhaps, of the company, will not be able to work or deal with each other again in the future in any sort of practical sense. Finally, um, as far as this slide is concerned, um, it's worth emphasising that uh, the courts will only grant a form of relief that it considers fair in all circumstances, that is fair to all interested persons. And those interested persons include not just the protagonists, they may include other shareholders against whom unfairly prejudicial conduct is not alleged, and they may include creditors in the company, um, and uh, I can see no reason why it might not extend to other stakeholders in the company, such as employees in appropriate circumstances. The courts will uh, do its 
best to uh, grant relief in a form that avoids or seeks at least to avoid unjust enrichment to anyone. In particular, the court uh, will be astute to avoid overvaluing the shares to be purchased, resulting in a, an unjustified windfall to the petitioner. When assessing the uh, 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 appropriateness of a uh, form of relief, um, the conduct of the petitioner may again be relevant. It may be relevant, for example, in assessing what, if any, relief is fair and proportionate in any given case, or the extent of any relief that uh, should be granted. The court may uh, quite clearly order um, a form of relief that is not the form of relief that is sought by the petitioner. So it is um, uh, uh, quite clearly the case that the court may be uh, persuaded of the existence of unfairly prejudicial conduct by the petitioner but not prepared to accede to an order sought by the petitioner for um, him to be entitled to purchase the respondent's shareholding, but rather order the, order the respondents guilty of the unfairly prejudicial conduct to purchase his shares at uh, their fair value. The relief uh, can quite clearly be against any and all respondents who are found guilty of unfairly prejudicial conduct of the affairs of the company, but should not be ordered against innocent persons or persons not party to the proceedings. The court is not restricted to making orders against members of the company. As I've indicated previously, um, a, a director uh, 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 who is not a shareholder can be engaged in uh, uh, the unfairly prejudicial conduct of the affairs of the company. And an order for relief can be made against that director or indeed senior manager of the company um, uh, 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 if, for example, uh, they could be required to purchase the petitioner's shares in an appropriate case. I think I've already mentioned as well the final point mentioned on this slide, uh, which is that um, relief can also be ordered against the company. Indeed, that's one of the reasons alongside uh, requiring it or uh, 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 to effect disclosure of relevant documents that a company is joined and required to be joined into these proceedings. By far, however, the most common form of relief is the purchase order. And I'll now concentrate on that form of relief and uh, uh, certain observations in relation there too. Usually, a purchase order requires the uh, purchase of the petitioner's minority shareholding by either the perpetrators of the unfairly prejudicial conduct of the company's affairs or by the company itself. However, in appropriate cases, the court might be persuaded to order that the petitioner should permit, uh, 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 should be permit, permitted to purchase the respondent's shareholding. An order may permit a minority shareholder, therefore, to permit a majority interest. That, however, is a pretty rare phenomenon in this context. Invariably, the price ordered to be fair is the, oh, sorry, ordered to be paid is the fair value of the petitioner's shareholding. That fair value is often equated to um, uh, the market value of the petitioner's shareholding, achievable on a hypothetical sale in the open marketplace, but thereafter adjusted to take account of the unfairly prejudicial conduct that is proved or established. In its judgment, the court will identify the assumptions to be made in arriving at that fair value. Those assumptions are generally designed to eliminate the effects of the unfairly prejudicial conduct. So as to render the price fair in all the circumstances. The usual date for the valuation to take place is uh, the date of the court's judgment. 
but it's important to emphasize that the court does have a discretion to uh, select another date as the appropriate date for valuation of the interest that is to be bought if the circumstances of the case are such as to justify the choosing of an alternative date. For example, the court uh, might consider it fair in all the circumstances to um, uh, uh, order an earlier date of valuation than uh, its judgment date if, for example, the petitioner had been uh, unfairly excluded from participation in the affairs of the company and uh, its fortunes have dramatically declined uh, following his exclusion. Once the court has determined the date for the valuation, then it is clear that all events um, uh, 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 prior uh, uh, to valuation or pertaining as at the date of valuation and all information that would have been available to a prospective purchaser as at that date will be taken into account in determining the fair value of the company as a whole and the petition, petitioner's shareholding uh, in the company. That information uh, may include, of course, forecasts as to future performance of the business, those contained in a business plan, for example. But supervening events, uh, those taking place after uh, the uh, date of the hypothetical purchase would not have been uh, available, um, information in relation to those events would not have been available to uh, the hypothetical purchaser and are so consequently um, uh, uh, irrelevant for the purposes of uh, valuing uh, the fair value of the interest to be purchased. That uh, point was neatly and uh, poignantly demonstrated in a recent case, uh, the case of Dingless and Dingless. There the court was asked to identify the appropriate value, uh, valuation date for the purposes of a purchase order, which it did, identifying that date as the date of its purchase order, that was the 25th of June 2019. That was a date uh, prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus epidemic, or certainly prior to the uh, 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 world's um, uh, uh, knowledge of uh, uh, that outbreak. The respondents applied for a direction that the price uh, that they were to be uh, uh, required to pay should reflect the disastrous effects that the coronavirus epidemic could have had on the value of the company. But the court straightforwardly rejected that contention, saying that the uh, potential of that outbreak was, uh, or, or, or the effects of that outbreak, were not known as at uh, the date uh, identified as the date for uh, purchase, and uh, consequently the valuation uh, was to be made without uh, taking into account um, uh, the effects of that coronavirus epidemic on the value of the company. Let me turn to expert evidence in this context. It's almost always required in order to assist the court in determining the value of the company uh, and consequently the value of the petitioner's interest and the price that should be paid under the terms of the purchase order. It often um, is, uh, 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 directions are often given for it in the form of uh, a report from a single joint expert, but if the uh, uh, amount at stake or the issues involved in valuation uh, are of such complexity as to justify it, permission may uh, be given for each side to instruct their own expert. Turning to methods of valuation, in the case of a trading company, um, uh, the usual method of valuation is the application of a suitable multiple to the future maintainable profits, together with the addition uh, of any uh, of the value of any surplus assets that tends to provide the end, or that's uh, provide something which is uh, uh, often referred to as the enterprise value uh, and identifies the fair uh, value of the company against which the value of the um, uh, petitioner's interest uh, can be assessed. On the other hand, if the company is not a trading company but an investment company or a property owning company, then it'll usually be valued on the basis of its net assets 
and in providing uh, that asset-based valuation, there's often a need for revaluation, particularly in respect of property assets, which are held at uh, 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 their costs or uh, otherwise not recorded at their current values. The current tendency, uh, I think, is more and more for experts to give their evidence in a hot tub environment, certainly that's my impression, and indeed uh, I have been pleasantly surprised by um, the effectiveness of hot tubbing experts as far as um, valuation evidence is concerned in these cases. I'll just uh, uh, emphasise again that um, the courts have made uh, uh, quite explicit statements about the desirability of obtaining expert evidence of value at an early stage in order to further the prospects of consensual uh, resolution of these cases. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think last week or perhaps the week before, um, that tends to be the death knell to applications for uh, the uh, uh, giving of directions for the determination of a preliminary issue um, as to an entitlement to a purchase order prior to um, uh, uh, obtaining uh, expert evidence and the determination of the fair value to be paid for that uh, petitioner's shares. Where the company uh, comprises a quasi-partnership, uh, a subject which we discussed uh, uh, in the um, uh, second of these uh, seminars, that is where a company has a limited number of participants who are each involved in the management and control of the business and affairs of the company, then the court can ordinarily be persuaded to order that the price to be paid for uh, the petitioner's shares should be a proportionate part of the value of the whole company or undertaking. In other words, uh, the court can be persuaded that no discount should be applied to reflect the minority status of the petitioner's shareholding. The rationale for that approach in uh, the case of quasi-partnerships seems to be that the conduct complained of uh, in the context of a quasi-partnership generally is also likely to be sufficient to justify an order for the winding up of the company on the just and equitable basis. That, of course, would involve uh, a, a sale of the assets and business of the company as a going concern and a distribution of the proceeds to the shareholders um, uh, proportionate to their shareholdings. Uh, having said that that's the general rule in relation to quasi-partnerships, I should just say uh, in some circumstances, particularly where the petitioner's shareholding uh, may have been acquired by gift or at an undervalue, it may be possible still to persuade the courts to apply a discount to reflect the uh, 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 minority status of the petitioner's shareholding. In contrast, in non-quasi-partnership situations, it was uh, often the case that the court would apply a discount when identifying the fair price to be paid to the petitioner for his shares. That approach is now seemingly out of favour. Uh, the guiding principle, it seems, is that the petitioner should be paid whatever is a fair value. And even in the case of a company that's not in the nature of a quasi-partnership, uh, that value might not be reflected in a discounted price. For example, the, the petitioner may not uh, 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 have desired to sell his shares. He may not have been willing or prepared to sell his shares at a discounted price and requiring him to do so in the face of uh, uh, unfairly prejudicial conduct might in fact result in a windfall for the respondents. Uh, in other words, the respondent might uh, be permitted to obtain, for example, a controlling interest in the company at a discounted price, when in truth, um, he might in fact have been prepared to pay a premium for those shares. Before I leave the subject of purchase orders, let me just touch on a couple of other uh, 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 issues that frequently arise in relation to them. First, as I've just indicated, where there is a potential marriage value between the shareholding to be purchased and that held by uh, the respondents, then that marriage value is likely to be taken into account, uh, particularly if the uh, marriage value is 
one that is recognised as a result of taking the uh, relevant respondent over a critical threshold, say over 50% or 75% of the, the, the issued share capital or voting rights within the company. Uh, in those circumstances, then it may well be appropriate uh, uh, to, uh, 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 for um, uh, uh, a, a premium to be paid or recognised within the fair valuation of the subject shareholding. Notional costs of sale are, are often taken into account when assessing the fair value. Um, there will not be costs of sale, but there would have been had there been a realisation is the theory. Um, so often notional costs of sale may be deducted from the fair value uh, payable to the petitioner. Very often the respondents, um, particularly in circumstances where they don't have available sufficient resources to enable them to pay immediately for the price determined by the court, uh, may be afforded time to pay that price. Um, uh, it, it, that may be considered fair in all the circumstances. It may depend uh, to some degree on the conduct of the respondents as to whether the court will be indulgent enough to uh, afford them time. Um, if it does afford them time, then generally um, interest will be payable on that part of uh, uh, the determined price that is left outstanding. Uh, whilst we're on interest, I ought also probably to, to highlight the fact that often uh, if a uh, date for valuation is selected other than the date of the court's order itself, say at a prior point when the uh, petitioner had been excluded from participation in the company, then uh, often uh, on top of the uh, price uh, as determined by the court by reference to the value as at that date, the court may also order interest as being payable on that price as well. I am now going to turn and briefly address um, uh, another important aspect of the practice in relation to uh, this area. I'm conscious that time's moving on, but I think I've got time to deal with this, uh, albeit briefly. Uh, and that other area is, as I highlighted at the beginning of this seminar, um, the subject of agreements or offers to purchase and applications to strike out. So, uh, as I think I mentioned in the first of these seminars, uh, this jurisdiction is subject to application under Part 24 of the Civil Procedure Rules for uh, summary dismissal in the ordinary way, um, if there is no real prospect of success, for example. But um, uh, 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 proceedings under Section 994 may also be dismissed on the basis that either their issuance or their continuation represents an abusive process if either the articles or shareholders agreement contains a mechanism for the purchase of the uh, uh, alleged victim shareholding um, uh, or, or provides that victim with uh, an option to have his shareholding purchased at its fair value or if the alleged victim has been made an offer by the respondents to purchase his shares again uh, for fair value. In other words, if he has been uh, made an offer that can be said to represent all that the um, uh, uh, petitioner might reasonably expect to get from the uh, issuance or continuation of proceedings, then uh, his issuance of those proceedings or continuation of those proceedings may be cons considered an abuse of the process of the court and subject to a striking out. But to form the uh, basis of a successful application to strike out a buyout mechanism, whether within the articles or a shareholders agreement or an offer to purchase, must effectively provide for payment of the fair value in all the circumstances as they are pleaded within the uh, 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 petition. As far as offers to purchase are concerned, if they're going to be considered to be fair, they need to be very carefully drafted indeed. Um, in essence, uh, 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 any offer that is to uh, form the basis of a successful application for uh, a strikeout uh, needs to be 
one that makes it clear and obvious that relief will not be granted to the petitioner beyond that contained within the offer itself. In particular, the uh, offer itself must uh, make it clear that the valuer to be appointed to value the shares is of an independent character. Um, the uh, uh, offer must uh, concede that adjustment should be made when identifying the fair value to reflect all of the alleged unfairly prejudicial conduct even though it's not actually uh, uh, proven. The offer must concede that uh, uh, no uh, discount uh, uh, should be applied to reflect the minority status. In other words, to take that issue out of debate. And uh, finally, the offer must uh, uh, involve a fair procedure uh, to uh, both the petitioner and the purchasing respondents. It must, in other words, ensure an equality of access to the petitioner in respect of all records, documents and information relevant particularly to, to value uh, in respect of the company. Um, and similarly, it, uh, in the context of ensuring fair procedure, it ought to also um, uh, ensure that the uh, evaluation is made in the light of uh, uh, representations made by all concerned, particularly uh, the petitioner, as to what a fair value is in any circumstance, any particular given, set of given circumstances. I think it's fair to say that um, uh, offers to purchase uh, and uh, 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 the obtaining of a, uh, in, in practice, the obtaining of a striking out in the face of an offer to purchase is never uh, uh, particularly straightforward. Um, but it's also, I think, uh, 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 realistic to suggest that uh, a properly formulated offer of uh, purchase for val fair value can very often represent the quickest way to resolve what are widely uh, recognised as notoriously expensive proceedings. That brings us to the end of uh, the slides. Um, but before I go, I just want to um, highlight one other aspect of this jurisdiction, which I think is important um, for practitioners to bear in mind uh, whenever they deal with a case of this nature. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, form of litigation is uh, one that is eminently suitable to uh, 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 both mediation and other forms of alternative dispute resolution procedures. Um, the reason for that is, in my view, that this litigation is of a highly transactional nature. It's not what I would describe as all or nothing litigation in the sense of a personal injury claim, for example. Uh, resolution tends generally to involve one side getting a fair value for uh, his shares, whilst the other side gets the shares themselves. There is not an absolute winner and loser uh, uh, in this uh, litigation. And because of this transactional nature, disputes of this sort are, to my mind, uh, particularly suited to uh, commercial settlement. And often uh, commercial settlement uh, can be achieved uh, through uh, a, a sensible facilitation uh, by the services of a suitable and uh, uh, experienced mediator. Practitioners uh, should, however, be cautious about um, uh, the use of mediation in the context of these sorts of disputes. Uh, my experience is that, um, although uh, used properly, the uh, form of mediation can be very helpful in resolving these disputes. Increasingly, I think um, uh, it's increasingly common that uh, mediation processes are being used in an abusive manner within this uh, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, particularly, it seems to me, misuse is being made of mediation uh, in circumstances where there's no substantial intention to settle, but simply to obtain 
uh, early disclosure of documentary evidence or evidence as to value, or to obtain a, a, a better feeling as to the degree of confidence held by the other side um, in the dispute. Uh, uh, obtaining that sort of information, that sort of disclosure, or that sort of feeling as to the confidence held by the other side uh, can very often be of uh, significant use in guiding the parties as to levels at which protective costs set, uh, 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 sorry, protective settlement offers uh, might be made, uh, particularly protective settlement offers in terms of costs. So uh, whilst I would encourage you certainly to explore um, uh, uh, mediation and other forms of uh, alternative dispute resolution in the context of these disputes, and indeed the courts would echo that encouragement, I do so with uh, that note of caution. I think that is a convenient place to uh, finish this series of introductory talks in uh, relation to the protection of shareholders from unfairly prejudicial conduct. Uh, a number of questions have been raised with me uh, via email. I hope that during the course of these talks, I've addressed all of those questions that have been raised. I I've tried to do so as we've gone along rather than just storing them up uh, for the end of these seminars. Certainly, if you've got any other questions, then please do email me or better still just give me a call. Um, I'm always happy to discuss discuss matters, um, certainly on a preliminary basis and without charge um, uh, uh, over the phone. I hope you've all found these talks interesting. Uh, as I hope you will have all recognised, there are now video recordings of the previous talks and there will, of course, be one in respect to this talk. Uh, please um, uh, encourage you, any colleagues who might find them useful to uh, uh, view those videos. They will be accessible from the Commercial Chamber's website shortly. Um, finally, uh, can I encourage you all to download a copy of uh, the Case and Statute Citator that I produce. I, 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 uh, as, as I've said, I think it forms the appropriate notes to these seminars and should provide a clear source of reference uh, uh, to the authorities in this area. Um, I look forward to working with some of you in due course. Um, until then, I wish you all well and uh, I'll say goodbye and end the Zoom meeting. Many thanks for joining me. Bye.